Directors, I'd like to welcome you to Universal Studios for our special 35th and a half anniversary uh, <laughs> screening of Jaws. Um, it's you know kind of interesting to you know I'm assuming most of you are VES members, so you've probably uh, you've heard my speech at one of these little things where I say that you know we. As concerned as we are with the new technologies and the new things affecting uh, our business and our industry, we also realize that there's an industry to begin with, because of, but because of the contributions of others, those that have come before us, both films and uh, artists. And so one of the things that we feel uh, that it's important that we do is we look back and we talk to people and find out how things are done. And the more I do this, the more I come up with the little uh, saying, the more things change, the more they stay the same. And uh, it doesn't matter if I'm on a show at Rhythm and Hughes and, and it looks really bad and, and, and the newbies are, are complaining about, wow, this is really tough and it's like, oh, stick around, it's gonna get a whole lot uh, a lot worse and uh, uh, you know it's been that way for quite some time and uh, so anyway we're here to talk about JAWS and, and the interesting thing is um, you know we're all used to working on tentpole films and blockbusters and summer blockbusters all these catchphrases and we have to realize that films were made before those terms became commonplace. And when you look back at history, you realize that there's probably a film that's responsible for that. And Jaws is one of those. Uh, you know, it wasn't until uh, uh, Star Wars and uh, you know, the other film, Empire Strikes Back, came out that the summer blockbuster was defined, and it was generally defined as starting with Jaws. So uh, on top of that, because of the rise of computers and digital technology and all the great tools that that kit provides, we tend to forget that uh, you know there's special effects, there's on-set stuff, and there's well, there was a period in cinema, and it wasn't that long ago, where what you see is what you got, or what you wanted to get was what you had, you know, what you could only see, and so uh, that's why it's kind of neat to uh, to. Uh, come here and look back at those, those, those films. So enough of me prattling on. I'd like to introduce a couple of uh, very special guests. Uh, with us is art director, and, or will you production designer on this film? Was they it didn't give that credit. Uh, okay, so art director, okay. Uh, Joe Owls. <laughs> also with us today is uh, one of the special effects guys, one of the guys who, who probably uh, shed uh, a certain amount of sweat and, and probably even some blood, uh, and who actually got his uh, start right around the time of Jaws, is Kevin Pike. <laughs> we were hoping to have uh, Roy Arbogast here uh, as one of the, 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 the senior effects guys. Unfortunately, fighting off a little bug, it's all going around. So um, we, we can't have him. Uh, we'll hopefully do a Close Encounters one of these uh, next year or something like that. And then we'll, 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 get, we'll get him there as well. Um, and then we, we Greg Nicotero, uh, Greg Nicotero, come on, come on up here. Greg Nicotero uh, uh, is the N in K and B. Um, uh, 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 much too young to have worked on Jaws, but like me, was influenced you know, by, 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 by films, and um, you know, it's, it's kind of neat because here you've got Greg, who saw this as uh, a wee lad, and uh, was inspired by it, and has uh, sort of, you know, sort of the next generation of, of, of physical effects, makeup effects, uh, uh, and things like that, and then also going beyond. So we wanted him to sort of help tie, you know, the past into the, uh, into the future. Um, anyway. I feel like we should have violins or something here for the, for the music. So, uh, Joe, let me start out with you. In the, you know, there's this script that this director gives you, uh, uh, and it's about a shark eating up people and on the water, and you've got, you know, <clears throat> it's, it's going to be shot on location, no, and that, that didn't happen at all. <laughs> I mean. 
Actually, I was on the picture before director. Okay. Uh, if you want the whole story, it started, uh, David Brown bought the book. Mm -hmm. I had worked with uh, Zanuck and Brown and Sugarland Express, Steven Spielberg's yeah. first picture, and developed a pretty good relationship with them. <clears throat> so they bought the galley sheets. Uh, they sent me the galley sheets the, from the book, before a script, before a director. I mean, this is sort of unusual. But they didn't have a production number, so they couldn't charge it. They knew I was a staff art director there, and I was working on a television movie, so I could probably do this work for nothing. <laughs> and Zanuck and Brown had a production deal uh, uh, with the Universal. Yeah, but you need a number yeah. to charge somebody to it. So uh, David called me and said, look, we're going to have, um, we, got, we just bought this book, and uh, it, it's we've got a shark, and we want to have a meeting with the studio, and, and we, if you could do some sketches for us to illustrate uh, what the shark does. So uh, I did probably two dozen, maybe 30, very large charcoal sketches of the shark activity, um, which um, really looked more like Moby Dick. You know, and, 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 <laughs> well, you know, I, I had them throwing the harpoons and not shooting mm -hmm. it. And uh, I didn't have really much to go by at that time. Didn't really know exactly what a white shark looked like. I mean, th these are just big, con huge things mm -hmm. look like a whale. And based on that, then, uh, there was a meeting. And Spielberg had not signed to do the movie. Uh, he wanted to actually want to do a pirate movie. But we would talk because there was a possibility that he might do it. And um, so Zanuck and Brown and the heads of the effects department, uh, the art department heads, production uh, manager uh, Bill Gilmore, a few other people, and it took place in Marshall Green's office, who was the head of physical production up in the Black Tower. So I did my big spiel on <clears throat> the shark and this and that, and you know, everybody just let me go on. Selling the concept. So we wanted to get the reaction of the special effects department, which was extremely negative. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I could see it was getting um, Marshall Green a little upset. And so they said, you know, this is gonna take years and years, and of course, Danica Brown knew that the book's going to come out in January. This is like late summer, mm -hmm. 73. And um, so um, they were saying, no, oh, you know, this could take two or three years. I don't know if we could do it. Besides, we got uh, uh, Earthquake and the Hindenburg. And, uh, and Marshall <laughs> got really mad. And he said, Jaws could be a bigger picture than the Hindenburg. And you know, everybody sort of laughed because uh, Hindenburg was going to do their big picture. So the meeting ended. I don't know if you want this whole story, but this is... Keep going. The meeting ended, and, and I'm walking out, and Marshall says, uh, Joe, come here. And, and I knew Marshall, I've been, on, I've been on the lot now for 10, 12 years, uh, working my way as a set designer. I worked, worked for Hitchcock as an assistant art director, Torn Curtin, and I did all the uh, 90 episodes of Night Gallery. So I was pretty, they were familiar with me, but I was still a staff guy, one of the younger guys. He said, do you think you can get the shark made? And I said, of course. You know, I mean, right, it was a huge opportunity for me to try to do something. He says, okay, find somebody to make it and take it off the lot. Now, that was really not done in those days. Everything was in-house. Mm -hmm. You know, the art department was in-house, camera, editing, everything was in-house. You, you didn't do it. So I, uh, I said, yeah, and, and then I went about seeing if I could get it done. And I talked to some really top effects people, and they all gave me a real negative attitude. Uh, and now I'm talking to Stephen because he's getting more interested. And here we are, really naive, and we say, look at, you know, we've seen the old man in the sea, that thing looked like a big, you know, 
thing just laying there and phony, but you know, no tanks, no phony power. Full size shark in a real ocean. Yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> And so, what, what, what specifically was scaring off the seasoned effects guys? Was it nobody had done it? I, I mean, I went to Disney and they had made some full-size whales, but they did it in a tank. They mm -hmm. did it in a controlled environment. And anybody who made anything out the real ocean knew that we were really heading for trouble. Um, and so uh, there was this uh, naivety that we had. And Disney said, "Yeah, they'll make the shark, but they won't take it on location. Right. They'll just build it." Mm -hmm. And, and some other people had questions. And then someone, I was looking for a sculptor, he said, have you talked to Bob Maddy? <coughs> and I said, no. I, so uh, um, anyway, I met Bob. A and if you knew Bob, I guess he was about 65 uh, then, I mean, just a lot of energy, you know, yeah. and Bob could do anything, right? I mean, he had, yeah, yeah, we could do that. Yeah, we do this, you know. I said, okay. So he made a little wire sculpture, uh, and then he pulled it, and his mouth opened, and so oh, that's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, you know, we show, showed it to the executives, and they were okay, fine, let you know, get Bob to do it. So then Bob and I, I call this the Magnificent Seven, in, in that we went in search for key people. Uh, Richie Helmer to do electronics. So really, I, I, I'm afraid I, I forget a few of them, but there's this, this young guy called Roy Arbogast, and he was over here making breakaway bottles and uh, <laughs> talked to him. And he really, and that's why I wish he was here, because he was the guy that came up with materials that could float and sink. And, and, and uh, that's not easy because. You've got a problem if you just have a sponge yeah. and you put it down and it absorbs. So you need a, a floating you need control. water repellent yeah. thing. So that's how that started. And in the meantime, I, I made a four foot model of a white shark. In the meantime, I had gone to Scripps and I'd gone to Steinhardt at San Francisco and I found this young ichthyologist months ago. He is the absolute shark expert now. He does talk about Jaws occasionally. He was about 28 at the time. He came down and he detailed the shark with me. And so that's, uh, Bob found a place, Roly Harper's uh, uh, Catering, had a nice big backyard there and uh, with uh, Roy and, uh, and uh, there was, uh, Oh God, I forget the other guy. You know, but there were, as I say, six key guys besides Bob. And then, of course, it branched out as they needed people. Mm -hmm. And I got Bob Chandler to, to start sculpting thing. He was a guy here that I worked with on Night Gallery. And he was quite good. And, and that was sort of, uh, that was the beginning. I mean, I could stop there, but then there's location things that uh, don't 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 stop. Okay, <laughs> that, that's that's what we're here for. All right. Well, I didn't want to talk the whole thing, but but this is just sort of the groundwork because Kevin came on later, and uh, what happened was uh, it was winter, and uh, you know they said uh, this is the old days. We didn't have uh, location guys or anything. They sent the art director. And I, I keep saying art director because they didn't use, there's only a couple people yeah. that got production design credit then. Now everybody gets it. But uh, basically I got art director, but I think I probably was more of a production designer on this picture than anything yeah. I've done because I got so involved with the special effects department uh, in just trying to preserve the thing to look like a shark. But Bob had a tendency, he, he was, uh, I could say, uh, he was cheap. I mean, he'd go and <laughs> scavenge uh, rams and stuff, and you know, find used things. I mean, uh, C and H sales and Apex. Pardon? C and H sales and Apex. Yeah, I mean, yeah. he would just drag all this stuff, you know, and, and, as opposed to just getting the top of the line of everything, you know. But in any case, uh, so it was winter time, and uh, they said, uh, "Go find a location." Uh, so I had two things I had to do. I had to find a thing that 
looked like. Now we had a script, first draft by Peter Benjamin. Uh, New England, uh, beautiful New England. And then I needed uh, a day with a tremendous view uh, and a certain depth uh, because the mechanism that Bob designed was this huge platform that he would float out, very clever. And then it, these barrels would flip over and then it would sink down. And then the shark would be on this, it had a traveling track, sort of a crane arm. But if you think about it, uh, if you have a tremendous tide, you lose the shark, mm -hmm. you lose the shooting tide. Right. So I had to find a place that had a small tide. Yeah, right. Not, and, not a great change. And a depth of about right. 25 feet. So I had nautical charts and everything. But I met with Peter eventually uh, in New York. And it was so funny because I had all these maps and I said, well, where did you write it for? He said, well, Montauk a little bit, Stonehenge, uh, Sank Harbor. Uh, and he pointed to these places. So, And I said, what about these islands? Uh, Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket. He said, um, nothing in Martha's Vineyard. Go to Nantucket <laughs> and, and have lunch with uh, my, my, my mother and my father. Uh, Nathaniel Benchley was a the Russians are coming, the Russians are coming. <laughs> so I started off driving actually to Amity, all the way up to uh, the little town of Amity, uh, up the coast of Long Island. And I'm getting out and it's freezing cold and I'm looking at beaches and they're just covered with snow. You know, this is <laughs> absurd. So I finally get down um, to uh, Woods Hole up in the bottom of the cave. And I get a ferry to Nantucket. And it gets halfway there, and the, and the weather's so bad they turn back. <laughs> so I'm thinking. An omen. Hmm? An omen. Thinking, well, there's a ferry to Nantucket, to Martha's Vineyard. That's only five miles or something. Okay. So I took that. And, and, and not to elaborate, but I'll never forget it was so cold, and I came into this, the only hotel open. Buffalo Bills were playing. Somebody and O.J. Simpson ran for 200 yards. <laughs> I'll just never forget that, you know, uh, because that, he, he ran for 2,000 yards. Doing and I started scouting Martha's Vineyard, and it was like perfect. And there's this big bay. Look, it's 25 feet. What's the tide here? Two feet. It's got to be in yeah. heaven, you know. So then I went back home and I displayed all those pictures because we used to take yeah. pictures and pin up a no, I guess we do it differently. <laughs> <laughs> it's different. I know it's, it's different. different. You can, you, 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 you can you just Google send them it. home. I mean, I went to India and scouted, uh, it, it took a thousand pictures, didn't have anything developed until I got home. Today you could say, oh, no, I don't like that one. But there's a lot of things that we did that were different, it seems like. Uh, centuries ago. Uh, but that was the uh, that was the beginning. Uh, that's how the shark started. That's how Stephen had some uh, somebody said we should go to Marblehead and a few other places. And anyhow, we did, but they didn't have all the elements that Martha's Vineyard had. Zanuck was very, had trepidation about Martha's Vineyard because of the Chappaquiddick thing with Ted Kennedy. And that caused a lot of tension. And besides, there are a lot of rich people that live in Martha's Vineyard. I mean, I think I almost ran into Walter Cronkite's boat with the shark one time when we were doing something. <laughs> and I met him and I talked to him about it. And he said, he's such a cool guy, you know, he said, we used to sneak around and watch you guys shoot, you know. I mean, this is what, you know, yeah. it was very cool. Anyway, that, that was the beginning. How did, how, did you, how did you test all that? It seems like this is one of those things where it's like, okay, we can, we, you know, the concept is we'll have a submergible platform on, on, on tracks and it'll be on an arm and we'll flood it and we'll counter sink it and you can do a certain amount of it, but there's also a big leap of faith and yeah. a big scaling up from going into any tank that you may have to... It was walk. never tested. Uh, it was dry tested and, and there was a an actor strike pending. 
Oh. <laughs> uh, the end of June. And the studio said, and we got to get this out for summer because the book has come out now yeah. and it's hot. So we got to start shooting. Whether we have anything or not, we got to start shooting. I'm sure you. Okay, so like does that sound familiar to people who are working in the business today? <laughs> okay, nothing has changed. The more things they change, the more they stay the same. So you, you rushed out there, you know, to, to you know. Well, you know, I, and when I see the making of Jaws, or Jim Farber said, we, we should have tested it before, and this and that. Well, we, I don't know where we're going to test yeah. it. We didn't have the water here to test it. We could have tested the sea sled shark. You know, there were three sharks, left and right sea sled. It was pulled 300 feet behind the boat. And Bob was real smart. He used pneumatics instead of hydraulics. In case a hose broke, we wouldn't have oil. We would have air. Uh, but the platform really couldn't be tested. And the first time we tested the platform, we had Zanuck there and Brown and everybody. <laughs> Bob floated it out and put it up, and it flipped over. <laughs> <laughs> And um, <laughs> I mean, those poor effects guys, I gotta tell you, they worked how oh, seven days a week, 14 hours. I get a little upset when I hear people badmouth the special effects department and the shark. And Stephen has been guilty of that, and he's had to backtrack. Oh, you know, it's a good thing that the shark didn't work because we, you know, we used the barrels and we used this and that. Uh, I don't think it would have made any difference. I think we were going to use it. I, I did all the, all the storyboards and, 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 you know, we knew what we were going to have to use. One thing, when I did those big sketches, is what we wanted the shark to do. When I did the storyboards, it's what the shark could do. Mm -hmm. So the, here's the limitations. Right. It can move this way, it can move this way. It could go up here and it could do this. It can't swim away. Mm -hmm. That they had to go shoot real sharks, and that's another story. Yeah. To get <laughs> so, Kevin, yeah. uh, you had been uh, working, on, uh, I believe, on the East Coast, uh, and were somewhat of a. You, you came onto this uh, later on in the in, in the process. Why don't you talk about sort sort of how you you came involved in this? Well, I, I grew up in Connecticut. So was where I'm from. Why don't you swing the mic around? Um, Thank you. Uh, I grew up in Connecticut originally, and I had uh, an experience where I got asked to go to Florida. Short story is that I worked as a waiter down there, and it was the year that Nixon decided to have all the price freezes and the gas, and uh, nobody could buy gas and uh, couldn't get down to Florida. And it wasn't going well, and the bartender said, hey, I'm going up early to Martha's Vineyard. I work at the Harborside, and I bartend there all summer long. You're a great guy. Why don't you come on up? I know the owner. Get you in early. They got dorms, they got everything you could ask for. Um, come on up and you could be one of the head waiters there all summer long. I said, great. I headed up to Martha's Vineyard. Um, and I got there um, early April. It was snowing on the Mass Pike. My truck broke down. I had to borrow a car to finally get out there. And when I did, the lady that ran the restaurant decided that this year that she was in charge, she was going to have all women to the waitressing, and <laughs> I ended up getting the job as the busboy. The busboy. Uh, it was a big contrast from being in Florida, where it was warmer, to say the least. But the important part of the story is that everything that you could probably have stacked against you as a young kid trying to figure out what to do in life was against me at the time. I was cold and hungry and tired, and I was the only busboy. It was a car. It was a um, a wharf uh, restaurant right at the end of the pier. It's mentioned right. in the movie. It's a great. But I was the only one taking care of all these gals. It was French style. We had to go upstairs. It was, I was not happy. I didn't make a lot of money. I lived in a little rooming house. It was a double. I had uh, no money to get off the island. And when you let yourself get to that point, you know you're really in trouble. And you've only been there a week. So I used to, I used to come down from, from my little double rooming house and run and eat at that diner, a tuna fish sandwich, a glass of milk, go work lunch, come back, tuna fish sandwich, go back, do dinner, come back home dead tired. And it was Saturday, April the 14th, and everybody there was politely sipping their lobster bisque and doing what they do. But over here at this table, there was a lot of noise, and it was like they were from another planet. <laughs> and it was like when you go to Vegas and people are real quiet at the blackjack table and they're pulling the slots, 
But over there at the craft table, that's where the action is. That's the party. So I kept listening to these guys and kept them watered and oiled to the best of my ability. And there were six people sitting at that table. There was Jim Fargo, Joe Ells, Mike May, John Dwyer, Ward Welton, and Jimmy Woods. That's the construction coordinator, the painting foreman, the set decorator, his lead man, the unit manager at the time, and Joe Alves. And that was Wood Brothers, yeah, with Gary and uh, Jim. Not, it, uh, but, but he was not Gary yet. was right. Mike, Mike and uh, uh, Gary were not there yet. Oh, they, they were. No, they just those six. What did they say? You said Wood. Jim Wood, the construction coordinator. Oh, Jim. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. You remember him? <laughs> yeah. He was a construction coordinator. Yeah. Jim, and um, uh, so, uh, so for, it, it, it was like moth to flame. This is something. This activity, this excitement. And I remember it vividly. And um, sure enough, they had the happiest meal in the place, and then they left, and I had to bust up the table. Somebody left the police underneath the table. And I grabbed it. It was a satchel. And I ran up, and there they are. They're still out in the parking lot talking. I mean, they had to walk up a block and a half to the Kelly house. And they're out there talking just like they own the aisle, you know, so kind of, we're making a movie. And I said, did somebody leave this? And he goes, oh, gosh, I, I, you know how important that is? And I said, no, I don't. You know what's in there, son? No, I don't. He said, in there, that, that's the storyboards. You know what storyboards are, don't you? I go, no. Well, it's like, it's like a comic book, what, like you make of, of the whole movie. And I said, are you making a movie? And he said, yes, we're making a movie. And I said, what's it about? And Joe said, it's about a shark that's going to eat your whole island. <laughs> <laughs> so that was my first introduction to the film people being on the island April the 14th. Not having uh, a good time at the restaurant, I, uh, I promptly quit. And uh, I was pretty, uh, pretty beat up about it. And um, uh, tried to figure out a way how to get home. And I had this imagination that... Uh, there might be some mail at the Egerton General Delivery and there'd be money in there and I don't know what I was thinking. I was hallucinating by that time. And I walked up the steps and down the steps came Jimmy Wood, the construction coordinator. He said, hi, remember me? I met you there, blah, blah, blah. And he said, yeah. He said, are you ready to go to work? I said, you bet I am. He said, what can you do? I said, I can do anything. You just show me one time. He says, well, can you run power tools? Oh, yes. You know, you always say yes. And um, he said, okay, well, then you start tomorrow, $3.50 an hour. I said, count me in. The next day, it was a, uh, not a cattle call, but it was the beginning of the collection of the workers. And it was at the boathouse down on Fuller Street in Martha's Vineyard. They had the orca in there. And they had Marty Miller, the foreman, who I'd met that Easter Sunday, ironically. And Jimmy was kind of a, uh, just, a, just a general Hollywood type, and he was the construction worker to drive this whole project forward, and he lined us all up. And I remember uh, April the 18th, and it was snowing, and I was kicking snow off my boots as we listened to this drill sergeant. And we had all kinds of craftsmen, finished carpenters and boat rights, and just a, a collection to, of any kind that, of local hires that come down. I was a busboy. That's how much talent. <laughs> and Jimmy started his speech. Okay, we are not building the Vanderbilt Mansion. We are not going to build these things to last nor'easters. We are not going to do anything except just build these flats, whip them together, slap some paint on them, shoot them, and then tear them down and throw them in the trash. So when I look out there, I only want to see one of two things. I want to see nothing but assholes or elbows. Any questions? <laughs> I raised my hand. He says, go ahead. I said, could I be one of the elbows? He <laughs> says, you're with me. And then after that, Jimmy and I became fast friends. And uh, my job was to rake the uh, rake. We didn't have brooms because there was dirt in the boathouse. And we raked the uh, boat. And uh, I took care of all Jimmy's paperwork and was basically his little office coordinator. And in short order, when things got ready, for the next phase, it was time to paint them, and Ward Welton was there, and I worked an awful lot with a very, very brilliant man who taught me an awful lot, not about painting too, but also, I mean, he did teach me wood graining and the scrumbling and the, the dry brushing and faux finishes, but he was very wise. He was very able to pick out of a group of people. He used to be personnel for the military, and he could tell that, that person's going to do this, that person. So when he spotted me, he latched on real quick. and. Um, he was an instrumental player in my, my career there on the vineyard. And then the day came and said, I'm turning you over. What do you mean? You're going upstairs. You have to go upstairs and help a guy named Roy Arbogast because the sharks are coming. And I went upstairs and we, the top of the boathouse was empty. It was a place they stored some of the boats during the winter there. And this is uh, maybe the beginning of May. And they said the, the sharks are coming and the effects guys are coming. 
well, that sounds interesting, but you know, I was never dreamt to be an effects man. I didn't really know the definition of what they did. And I went up and introduced myself to Roy Arbogast, and we opened up these doors, and it had a gin pole that went out, and up there you could actually see the um, Egerton Lighthouse, and, and you could see the ocean out there, and the breeze was just absolutely beautiful. And we just chatted and waited, and sure enough, here they came, truck after truck, one, two, three, big state, big trucks with the sharks in them. You couldn't really tell that they were sharks because they're still in the molds. They're all buttoned up. and I don't have to tell you what something in a mold looks like different than the final product. And all the effects guys were getting out and squirreling around and finding out where they were and what was going on. And I looked at Roy and I said, now excuse me, Mr. Arbogast, I'm looking at the Atlantic Ocean. I said to him, I'm 22 years old. Um, and I've never been in the motion picture business for more than a month. And I said to him, so tell me, what, what did you do? Did you, did you test all these out in the Pacific Ocean? And then he said, uh, no, uh, actually we haven't. We haven't even had them in the water. He says, as a matter of fact, the third one, we haven't even opened the mold, and we have no idea what the skin even looks like. And my eyes went, ka -ching. I had a feeling I was going to be there longer than the six weeks they originally asked. And then, of course, I ended up, after we, you know, paint the shark, Got to working with Roy, just brilliant at, at the products, like Joe said, getting this closed cell urethane, closed cell vinyl that we needed at the time, uh, and the elastomeric compound, which was brand new virtually at the time and had excellent stretchability and excellent memory, which he needed. And uh, of course, we had a lot of work to do on the jaws of the shark and the teeth and the mouth. And I ended up being the formula mixer maker with Roy that he had, and uh, we made tail parts, and we made the teeth, we did all of that, and then, of course, uh, Roy and I became fast friends and played with him for a lot of it, and um, I've worked six months on that show, uh, from my youthful point of view up on all the stories, all the histories, everything that went on all the way through the whole show. And at the end of the show, everybody started leaving. Truck by truck, people by people. You ought to come out to Hollywood. You ought to come out to Hollywood. And the last guy to leave was Nick Charlanzio. He was the accountant at the time. And I went down to his office, and he gave me a lunch, a paper bag full of cash, and a punch list. And he said, here's what you're going to do. You're the last guy. You're going to put the seed back on the lawn at East Chop at the Brody House where the teamsters had run over the lawn. You're going to take the overspray off of the Menemsha Post Office where Joe built the Quint House. And you're going to go and pull a ramp out of the water at Oak Plus. And I drove around two, two weeks all by myself in September 28th, maybe. That's how long, from April 18th, driving around saying, this isn't fun. How come this isn't fun now? And this because nobody was there. And so a month later, November the 4th, 74, I came out to L.A. and um, worked with Ward doing commercials and this and that. And uh, all the guys that Joe mentioned was, uh, you know, Richie Helmer, uh, Bob Matty, Tim Barr, Charlie Spurgeon, Eddie Zirkin, Gary Wood, Mike Wood, um, uh, and then other recruits came out after that. And obviously that was very attractive. So I was doing a commercial with Ward when I got out here, the short story, um, and Richie Helmer was doing bubbles. It was a Bob Hope commercial where he goes behind the stratum of oil. And Richie says, they're hiring at Paramount. And so in 75, I started at Paramount on a show called Islands in the Stream with Roy Arbogast, Mike Wood, Richie Helmer, and a new supervisor, <laughs> Alex Weldon. And the first thing we did, we were making sharks. We are making hammerhead sharks. And Don Chandler was the sculptor who sculpted the jaw shark. And he was there, and then I ended up in the business, and I've been doing it for the last 36 years. Yeah. Yeah. Listen, Greg, your turn. So, you obviously saw this, and I have a feeling said, said wow, that's kind of neat. Well, anybody that, anybody that has seen this movie, uh, I remember when it, when it first came out, it's, it's interesting because you hear a lot of stories about the photos being released and what a disaster it was that there were pictures of a shark in Time Magazine. And I remember sitting there and just studying every photo I could find of the shark. I, I was just absolutely enthralled with how they did it. I remember standing in the lobby of the movie theater in Pittsburgh, seeing the lobby cars and seeing the gigantic shark and just wondering you know, how they did it. And back then you didn't have the internet, there were barely uh, any outlets yep. for finding out how things were done. So, so the Time Magazine article that came out that was Summer of the Shark that had the painting of the shark and there was photos of, of the mechanical shark and then as the movie took off, there were more and more articles about how it was done. 
And that had a, a, a profound impact on me in terms of how they did it, you know, hearing the stories and listening to these guys talking and then trying to, I have a poster in my office that is all the guys standing around the shark in the dry dock, like one of the first times that it gets lowered. It was a book that Edith Blake wrote called The Making of the Movie Jaws. And again, what's amazing is when you see photos of the film being made, they shot, the bay where they shot, like the everybody that lived there just sat on the beach and watched them film. So they would take the shark out of the water between takes so that the salt water wouldn't destroy it. And you see like seven, 10 year old kids just sitting there watching them film the movie. And I, I, I just was in complete envy of like, wow, would it have been cool to be able to be that guy that sat there and watched how they shot it. So you become sort of obsessed with, you know, the quest for knowledge of how it was done. And, you know, I, I'm more interested in hearing what these guys talk than I am hearing myself talk personally. But, you know, the idea of lowering the platform into the water and then you have a bunch of guys in wetsuits that would have to go out and then attach the shark to the crane arm and and what the elements would do to it and seeing you know there's pictures of Joe with like scrub brushes scrubbing the shark and trying to figure out they would and, and again please correct me but my understanding was the shark the sculpture was done the plaster molds were done and then you guys made the skin and the mechanics separately and yeah, pulled the skin over the skin it. It wasn't like yeah. nowadays where we'll core it and there'll be a specific thickness and you'll have core molds and you'll build the mechanics to fit inside. Yeah. Yeah. You got to build the mechanics and then you build the skin and sort of slide everything over. So. Yeah, we had a time element. That was the basic thing. We had a time element so we couldn't wait for one thing to develop and then do the other. So we had to simultaneously do the outside and the inside and hope to hell everything fit. And of course, uh, when the testing started, uh, they didn't compensate for what the salt water would do to all the electronics. But, uh, you know, uh, speaking of Ward Weldon, uh, he was talking about the painter. Uh, there was some really tricky stuff just in the paint, uh, in that uh, it couldn't just be painted because the water would beat off like a balloon. So. Uh, they came up with the idea of Ward, and I think of Roy, uh, using number 20 silica sand simultaneously to give it this uh, rough effect. So, so it really had, uh, it was a, the, the painting was an incredibly uh, important part of it. Uh, I have a little story about, about the shark, about the color. This is another story that goes uh, down to Australia when we realized the shark, what the shark could do and what it couldn't do and it couldn't swim away. So we needed real sharks. Ron and Valerie Taylor did uh, the um, incredible documentary uh, on, on uh, sharks, the, uh, Blue Water White Death. And so I, I looked at it and I was looking at it on uh, Vernon Fields, the editor, who won the Academy Award for Jaws. Incredible person. She had a cam, it was a new editing device <laughs> at that time because it used to be the movie owner. And I'm looking at that and I'm looking at the, the, the shark and I said, My God, it looks the same color as uh, the cam. So um, Roy Ward said, What color should we paint the shark? I said, Vernon Fields cam. So if you ever see an old cam, that's how we got the color. <laughs> But I have a, a little story which is sort of amusing, if not frightening. Uh, Valerie Taylor said, we could only get 20, uh, 16 foot sharks. Now, when I had made the first shark, four feet, and I really was thinking, uh, with all my research, I had some really good details of a 12 foot shark, and I said, twice this would be good. And they had caught and they've known about 21 foot sharks. But I really thought 25 would be just big enough. So you know how you make a decision with executives? All the executives now wanted to get involved. So the, uh, I don't know if it still exists, there was a parking area that side, used to be the art department. And I had uh, the art department draw a 20 foot shark, you know, just a, an outline, and a 30 foot shark. I didn't draw a 20 foot shark. 25 foot shark because 
when you have executives, they would say, you know, that's a little big. That one's a little small. <laughs> so, I said, how about a 25 foot? That sounds good. That sounds good. Anyway, so that's how that happened. <laughs> now, so what we needed, uh, we're thinking, and I'm talking to Bill Gilmore and, and Zanuck, and, and uh, they're going to send uh, Frank Rico down there to uh, supervise the shooting, and um, or the art director I worked for for years. A and uh, the problem is, 16 foot shark would be big enough. So we're supposed to have like the Richard Dreyfus character under there, you know, sh shooting at the shark. And um, we thought, what if we get a small person? And I make a miniature cage, right? And we send him down, and now he's, you know, like four foot five, and the shark's 16 feet, and so that's going to look pretty yeah, full scale. Yeah. So we did that. So I had to get tanks made and all this stuff. I got them all suited up. It was a very small movie. I mean, uh, the art department had one person at that time, and then I would get people to help. I mean, it wasn't like a big movie. It was uh, picking a two, three million dollar movie. They wanted a four million dollar budget. We really knew it was going to cost six. That we cheated. <laughs> and um, so, anyway, they go down to Australia. And this little guy said, oh yeah, I could scuba dive, I could, but you know, it's like actors that say they could do anything, right? <laughs> <laughs> on Jaws 2, we had a sequence, it was all sketched out called Swim Eddie Swim. And we cast this kid and he shot all this stuff and, and then he's supposed to fall off the boat and swim. Well, he couldn't swim. <laughs> and you know, so these things happen. Anyway, so he gets down, they put him in the water, and here comes this great white shark, and he freaks out. Now, what I guess I didn't realize is that air tanks, for a small person, they suck as much air as a big person. So his air tanks were this big. And that took two uh, breaths, and he was out of air, and he was frightened. And uh, they pulled him up. Now I had another cage, a breakaway cage, and, and that was sitting on the side of the end of the boat there. And the shark starts attacking this cage. And it, it was incredible footage. And um, we got it back and Xanax looking, he said, wow, this is incredible stuff. But there's no Dreyfus, Dreyfus is supposed to be eaten. <coughs> well, okay, so maybe Dreyfus doesn't die. So maybe he gets out and he swims down there and he waits until, you know, whatever. And that's how that, happen so that way we could use that. So, uh, that, you know, it was interesting because it sort of really dictated the script uh, because of the, the great footage we yeah. had. I, I want to talk a little bit about uh, Bob Maddy. And, you know, he's famous for, amongst other things, the squid attack in 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, which, you know, is, is the jaws of, 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 of its time and, and is actually one of the sequences that you know, you, it, it's kind of age, but it really still holds up because it's such a good, yeah. a good story. But the progress in the, the technology between 20,000 Leagues and, and Jaws, what did he have to say about that? Did he, did he think that there was, you know, a lot, oh, if we had only had this back in, you know, 55 no, when we were doing this, or, we, or were things the same? He did that in the studio, so he had a controlled environment. When we got to the tank at MGM, now we have the shark web. And, and Bob was always saying, we should do dry for wet, dry for wet. And everybody was poo-pooing dry for wet. No, we can't do that. The irony is on Jaws 3, which uh, yeah. Jaws 3D, I, I ended up shooting at dry for wet, where I was the uh, effects guy. And it worked very well, you know. Uh, so uh, he, he was ahead of his time. What he was fighting was time. Today, no studio would say, you're going to go out and make a big picture in the ocean like that, and you're going to have three months prep. You know, let's face it. Um, I'll tell you what technology today could have done. Uh, I don't think that a CGI shark would uh, really make any difference. Uh, I think that the, the, from what I've gathered over all the years, the, the Jaws fans love that shark with the jowls and everything. It has a personality. Mm -hmm. a, a CGI shark, you know, they made a movie with it and it gets real slick. What could have helped us 
is when I scouted Jaws in, in the winter and from Hyannis Port on, there was just ocean and there wasn't a sailboat. Now we get out there yeah. and it's July and it's covered with sailboats. And Stephen, this 26-year-old kid, was so steadfast. He says, I'm not going to shoot anything where I see a sailboat. These guys are supposed to be out there by themselves. They're alone and nobody can help them. And I don't want to see a damn sailboat. And we waited until the sailboats would go you know, drifting across. Well, you know, today we just blip, blip, they're gone, yeah. right? Shoot anything, what the hell? We just uh, take them out. That would have helped tremendously. That would have helped our, our schedule tremendously. And uh, yeah. So, uh, Greg, you, you, you agree. If someone, if someone asked you to do another Jaws, remake, you know, a classic aside, if you had to do something like that where you were in an environment like water, uh, how would, you know, modern technology help you? You wouldn't do it? We, just, we actually just did a, a, ironically, Howard Berger's in the audience, who's my partner at K&B, and we just finished a film called A Dolphin Tale where we made animatronic dolphins. And the first couple days they shot in the, uh, in the ocean. And it was, it was funny because I was watching the Jaws documentary on the Biography Channel about how they're like, whatever you do, don't shoot in the ocean. <laughs> And, uh, and, you know, we built a, a really elaborate uh, puppet, which probably cost more than all three sharks cost in 1974 to build. Right. Uh, and, and ironically, it's like you still, you have a director who goes, no, it's got to shoot in the ocean. This scene requires this. You can stand there and tell them till the cows have come home. Listen, guys, you know what? Get your coverage here, and then we can go and shoot yeah. inserts and close-ups in a, in a tank, or we can do... You know, you, you, you try to, to guide them and tell them the best way to shoot things. And, you know, Howard literally just got back last week, and you still deal with the fact that no matter how well you try to plan things, you'll have, oh, well, you know, now, you know, the dolphin trainer has to get removed digitally from the shot, or, you know, that you, you build something that, that the real dolphin is supposed to interact with and doesn't. There's so many variables, and what, what Joe, I know, was, was saying earlier is the, the fact that back then they had to do all this without cell phones and without, you know, CAD drawings and without all, this, all the, the technology that we have. You know, Howard kind of joked and said that we built a Maserati that looked like a dolphin because it was really beautiful in terms of how it moved, and we took it to my swimming pool and threw it in the water, and the tail moved, and just the drag on the water, you're like, okay, well, we gotta fix this and make sure the skin doesn't weigh too much, and you know, you literally, I kind of, it was funny, the conversations we had, I kind of joked and said, these guys probably had the exact same conversations, and here we are, 35 years later, still having the same conversations because a production hands you a challenge and says, this is the movie we wanna make, and we're gonna have CGI here, we're gonna have practical elements here, and you know, it's, it's always intriguing to me because, you know, every tool has its function. Mm -hmm. And, you, you know, when you have actors standing in a tank interacting with a, real, with, a, with a real puppet, or you look at Jurassic Park, or even, you know, going back to when you were talking about um, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, and, or not, um, yeah, and the original squid scene was shot at sunset with yeah. a beautiful pink yeah. sky, and all of a sudden they said, oh, we see the wires, so, they had an idea, which is let's make it at night, let's put a storm going, and then you think about the, the footage with Dreyfus and the footage with that, um, that uh, they shot, Rodney Fox and them shot for the shark, and it's like they, you sort of have to be able to be flexible in how things work. You know, computer technology and visual effects certainly make a huge difference in terms of that flexibility, but when you're on set and you have 120 people standing around saying, the puppet has to work, hurry up, Lunchtime, we're going into meal penalties. There's a lot of pressure on building practical elements, and you have a whole crew sitting around, and the production manager's freaking out, and everyone doesn't know what to do. And you know, you have to be, you have to be on your game. And and you know, looking at what Stan Winston did in Jurassic Park, and the full size animatronics, and the visual effects, and what a perfect marriage that that was. So um, you know, the the technology certainly has increased, but. The demands that producers and directors give you oh, yeah. is still just as yeah. just as, as difficult. Yeah, yeah. Kevin, you yeah. want to follow up? I, I did. I just yeah. wanted to follow up on, on what Joe was saying about Bob Maddie. Um, there's a lot. There's a lot of people that have you know put in their two cents about the sharks not working and and, and all of that. And and I got to see it from a very pure, innocent uh, point of view. And because I got to be involved with everybody, 
um, for, for whatever reason, they enjoyed what my efforts, I guess. Uh, the, the fact is I got to see everything that was going on in all these workings. Um, what happened was, after we did Jaws, real quick, we went with Joe, I, I went with Joe and Roy and Steve, and we did a picture called Close Encounters. And then after that, we went on uh, Jaws 2 um, down in Florida. And at that time, I had advanced, and now I'm working for Bob Maddie, and basically his personal assistant, uh, did all the purchasing and then coordinating for that more than the hands-on stuff. But I got to be his, um, just his personal confidant. And he was an amazing man. He was old school, um, and he deserves a lot of credit for making a shark jump out of the water and jump on a boat and eat a guy when that's how you had to do it back then. And I really grew to love him. His relationship with Roy, sadly Roy's not here, was very, very close. And they were great friends for many, many years. But he approached things differently, like Joe said, about being cheap and things like that. And, um, you know, you need nuts and bolts. Go to my house and we'll go out in the back and there's some cans there. You get the cans and they're full of nuts and bolts. And he did. And he had cans, like, and then plywood and then more cans. And he'd reach in there and they're all coated with, like, a red, like, a red ketchup or something. And, and, and Bob, what, what, what is this? What is this oil to keep them? Pres oh, no, that's the tomato sauce from the cans. And he used to get them right over here at Michelli's Pizzeria restaurant. The bar. Okay, so the, 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 the couldn't sense with Bob and Maddie's story. On Jaws 2, we used to have this thing called our little getaway when the pressures got too much. We, we would take off for a drive in the station wagon with a teamster, and we would get uh, a beer, and we would have a beer in the car. We'd go for a little ride, and we'd come back. And of course, when you're on the East Coast, it was always uh, uh, so swank to get Coors beer on that side of the Mississippi. And at one time, they, uh, they, we used to have these cans that had pop tops on them. You might remember them, and they would come loose, and fish would swim in them and use them as waistbands. But then they came out with something called the Oregon can. This is Bob Maddie now. And we'd go out for the drive, and Bob would point and say, now see that tree? That tree has so much energy in it. And methyl, you, can, you could hug that tree and feel the energy. He was, you know, you think nuts and bolts, but he was out on that esoteric level. And so I said, Bob, you ready for your beer? Yeah, I am. And I gave him a Coors Oregon can. And it had a little dot you'd press, and you'd press that one in, and that's the vent hole, and then you press the big hole, and then you could drink. And we're driving, and Bob says, I don't like these cans. Why not, Bob? I, Perfect. What could go wrong? I mean, this, he's got to be impressed with the technology. And he says, I don't have the little tab. I said, I know. It's in the, it's in the can, Bob. You don't have to worry about it. He says, but I want the little tab. Whatever for. I said, Bob, why do you want the tab? He says, so I can play with it. <laughs> Bob met it. So, so that's the kind of guy that you had to deal with when you deal with Bob. I am. Uh... <laughs> Since I'm here with the visual effects uh, group, I have an opportunity to say something. I'm going to really date myself now, because we're talking about progress. My first job in the business was in special effects, as an assistant animator to one of the best animated effects guys that was, Josh Bennett. I'm so glad you're talking about this. I was going to bring it up. But... And uh, Josh did the fire and Bambi and. He did the night at uh, Bull Mountain. And it, it was just a freaky thing. It was a summer job, I thought, and, and through just odd situations, I was supposed to go to a training program, I was too late. I started working for this lady who happened to be one of Mickey Rooney's ex-mother-in-laws. And I said, what do I do? She said, you flip the pages and you draw like that. You look and you put them in between. I said, oh, okay, I could do that. Anyway, she worked for a few weeks, and then she had to leave, and she was working for this old guy, Dwight Carlisle, who was assistant to Josh Metter. And he says, okay, uh, here, you, you're working, we're working on this thing. And after about four or five weeks, he had to go to the hospital, and now I'm assisting Josh Metter. I'm 19 years old, and we're doing a picture called Forbidden Planet. And I'm doing the id. And we had, to, we didn't want to do ink and paint, so we were doing the two co uh, three color process system where you have red and, and blue, and so we would do two levels. We did the id, and then the, we did the hot, hot spot on another level, so they could we could just shade it. So every every uh, it wasn't the cell. Uh, every, every, uh, every paper uh, had uh, to be hand rendered, you know. So uh, 
that's where I started. Now, I went through the process of Jaws and Close Encounters and Escape from New York and a number of pictures, so I had that experience. But about 10 years ago, a little bit more now, uh, I was doing a CGI movie, animated movie, for an Indian company. And I'm in um, India, and I'm, it was like the castles and the town, and this, this old town, I was just, uh, Antonio Gaudi, I was just stealing his stuff. And I, I, I built all these sets at the computer, and we were walking through these motion capture animated people. And I'm thinking, it was 1990, why can't we put real people here? You know? I mean, the concept of actually building sets in the computer was like, huh? You know? And then, of course, we really did uh, Gladiator, and then from there, I mean, it's seamless now. You can't tell, I can't tell what they built and what's computerized. I mean, it's, it's gotten to be. So, anyway, I'm just giving you a little bit of history for the last uh, 55 years or so. And, and, and increasingly, you know, the art departments and the visual effects departments are now starting to work, you know, a little bit closer, and so that some of the tools that are used for pre visualization you know, for us in visual effects, can also be used by, you know, the art departments to, you know, pre the, the actual sets that need to be built to figure out what actually needs to be built physically and what, what will be oh, set, set, set extensions. And sometimes the same blueprints, yeah. you know, come over to us and it's like, okay, that way that guarantees that they're, you know, the art director or the production designer's vision uh, uh, even though there's budget constraints for the physical construction, make it into the final product. But there's so many things you could do. I was working on a picture that uh, for two years, and I made a movie that ran out of money. And, and the director was screwing around, and, and we had a really sharp editor, and she had, you know, the computer stuff. So I had like all my uh, storyboards, like 3,000 of them, and, and they were black and white, and then I would uh, eventually uh, make them color. And I just went ahead and made the movie, you know, without the director. I mean, I, we just stuck, we, I took all the storyboards and, 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 and she, you know, and, and if we needed a little animated thing, I'd go right and, and do that. And while they were screwing around what method we're going to use or, you know, what uh, process and all this, we actually made a previous. We made a, the whole movie, you know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and you could do it. I mean, you could just sit down with storyboard artists and you could scan them in, because the, the editing systems are so incredible now, you know? Too much, because, you, you know, producers can come and see four or five shots at the same time and say, I like that, I like that, and he shouldn't be wait, should wait till the director's cut. But, but anyway, <laughs> I mean, my, my daughter, you know, she sits around with her computer and throws stuff together. It's, it's amazing what you guys could do now. Well, and, and it's amazing what we can do, especially if we have, you know, a leadership and, and, and some vision, you know, uh, driving it. Yeah. You know. Here's the problem, yeah. is creativity versus selectivity. And there's too much selectivity now, I think, because you can do everything, let's do it, you know, as a part, you know, to create what you want and say, okay, that's it. Yeah, but we could do this and this. But then you lose the essence sometimes because you just overdo the damn thing. I mean, and, uh, you know, I'm saying that because a lot of times people in, in uh, you know, it's special visual art now, you say, well, yeah, we, we could do it. Yeah, but do you need what to? about the story? You guys know that. Yeah, and you know that. I'm a big fan of telling people that, you know, it's, sometimes it's good to have someone saying, no, you can't. You know, for whatever reason, the time yeah. schedule, it forces you to figure out what's important to you, what's important to the story, and uh, uh, then, you know, work, work from that. Well, let me just say this. John Ford's doing a Western. He's got 300 Indians coming over the hill, right? Because maybe that's what they had, Cheyenne and the Apaches and whatever. But today they'd have 300,000 yeah. because they could do it. <laughs> Even though there may never have been 300,000, and you'd say, holy Christ, I've never seen so many Indians, you know. <laughs> but we can do it, you know. That's the problem, I yeah. I don't know. Okay, you know what? Does anybody have any you know, questions? Maybe we should... <clears throat> no, wait, wait, wait.
Right here. Well, okay, go. I want to know their reaction once the film came out and it was such a huge blockbuster. Did they look back and think it was going to be such a historical uh, film? Well, I'll tell you what I thought. What I thought when we went to Long Beach, saw the first screening, if you were on the set of Jaws, you didn't hear John Williams' great music. What you heard were <laughs> and people were laughing, you know? They go, oh, look at that silly thing. God damn it. You know? We were afraid people were going to laugh. We, we just really were afraid they're going to laugh. And, and then they didn't laugh. And uh, you have comments? Yeah, I do. I just, um, ha having been there and then have come out here. And of course, I was a local hire, so I didn't work at the studios. And when they had the screening, it wasn't like I, I went to the premiere or anything. And I had to very much stand in line, and I couldn't get in the first day. And Joe and I did the last shot in Vern's pool. Oh, I'm going to tell about that. Go right ahead. Okay, can, now I, this, can, I, can I lead into it, please? No, is this, I, I, I'm going to let you have it. No, no. But you know, no. Ke Kevin was, Kevin came back. He needed some work. I had some work around the house. A lot of work, and Stephen came to me and said, "We could get one more screen, but we need, you know, this." So somebody stole the head. Somebody stole a camera. And I had Kevin here. I said, "Kevin, we got to build a boat." Go ahead. You built my boat. I, I, I was. I, uh, Joe was kind enough to give me some labor work in his house. We actually did quite a bit together on the weekends, and then he left me alone. We put in brick walkway, painted. Wood siding did a lot of improvements. He has a beautiful home, and, uh, and it was it was idyllic. It was classic California for me. It was a place where I could learn to love California for what it was out there in the Topanga area. Um, and he came home and he said, "We're going to do some work on Jaws." I was shocked. That's just how small the movie was. That's how small the movie was. <laughs> and so he said, well, "What are we going to do?" He said, "Well, we're going to build a little hull of the ship." We did two parts actually. Yeah. The first one was a hull of the ship. And it was the inside because the and new concept to me that sharks can hit boats and cause leaks and the same. And we shot in my driveway. And we shot it in his driveway. We had Rex Metz. It was a, a underwater cameraman, and uh, and um, he came and, and basically it was as simple as your student films. I mean, we built a V hull and we painted it. Remember, Ward Wilton taught me how to age it down and this and that. And then Joe said, "Let's cover it with tar paper and we can block the light off." We waited till dark. And basically, See we just, uh, no, I don't Dry run, and the you next thing is. Jimmy, let go home. <laughs> bum, bum, bum. Yeah. And, and, and then Joe says, I got something for you. And it's a tracing. It's a, a trace, tracing paper, and it's a, it's a round, ragged hole. I go, and? He goes, we've got another shot to do. I said, what's this one? He goes, well, we're going to make a hole in the boat. And I went in the back lot, and I traced it, and I got this. So we're now going to, so we made another hull, and we cut out that hole, that famous hole where Ben Gardner's head comes through, <laughs> and figured all this out. And um, it, the, the short story, because it's been often heard, we shot it in Verna's pool. Verna had a little room in the back of her house where she did her editing. She had her movie all the back there. And, um, and then Stephen and I had to go to Panavision and get underwater cameras, this and that, and Adele Armstrong, the makeup guy, was there. And basically, we took the V-hole and I put two by fours across the pool. Now, I'm only 23, I'm not in the The funniest part about it was Stephen and Verna had gone and seen the answer print that morning here and said yes, so they could start cutting up the negative, right? Meantime, we're in the pool. Uh, Rex is there. Frankie Sparks was a stunt man for Richard Dreyfus, yeah. and I had a head. So we had tanks and everything. I didn't have a scuba tank. No, I was the local hire, and I and I had a, a, a body with a head on it and a shirt, and I literally bent over and put the two by four of the hull on my back, and <laughs> and then I wiggled it because it's raw, and then I watched the light through the hole, holding my breath the whole time, and here comes Frankie Sparks. And as soon as I see the light and he grabs that tooth, I just kind of wafted the head through the <laughs> hole. And that was the shot. And we did it, as I said, 31 times. We printed tape 29. Stephen was very gracious. What more can we do? And, and then the next day, I went back to pick up the cameras and get everything returned. And he goes, Ronnie, show Kevin. Show Kevin the shot. 
And um, it was an amazing insert. And so the fact that I couldn't get in to see it in the movie, the story was I'm at the Chinese theater, then I'm with the audio, real audience, day two now, I guess a day worth of buzz on it. And the lady next to me is um, um, just, just going crazy. And I know the story, so I'm not reacting like she is. But when that head comes out and they all jump, it was a little feather in the cat. And she grabbed my arms, and when that shark was jumping, they tell me, please tell me, please tell me it doesn't come up on land. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but, but that lady actually, actually did say uh, that. So to me, it, it, was, a small movie. it was a small movie, and, and Joe, Joe made it big. And, and my enjoyable time with Joe was about how to take a look at it big. And his optimism and his excitement and everything drove that whole engine for that show. And again, Close Encounters, biggest set, Joe, still to record, right? I don't know. Come on, a big set there too. And uh, I learned all that kind of optimism, enthusiasm uh, from him, from Roy. I did seven, seven things. I learned everything about how to be a special effects man from Roy. And uh, I can't tell you uh, how exciting it was to be a part of that first show. It was such an exciting time for me at 22 years old because I was learning so much, so fast. I was making elastomer. I was learning about fiberglass. I was learning about sculpting and the, the walnut shells and the silica sand and the paint, all these techniques. Um, a, qu a quick story, uh, Ward kept telling me the company's coming to town, the company's coming to town. I go, what's the company? Well, don't I already work for the company? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, you screw around to the company. You, you, well, you, I guess you could, uh, but, but so now, so now it's nervous time, and yeah. Joe's on game, and we're at a little beach on Katema, and we've got the cabanas, and we've got the boardwalk, and we've got the beach, and then Joe says, "Well, let's get rid of all the seaweed," and I'm thinking, "Was he crazy? Beaches have seaweed, isn't that natural?" No, we rake it all nice and clean. It's going to be perfect. And Joe had this running fence for this tracking shot that he had it set up for Stephen. And he was breaking little pieces, so they had some kinetic uh, motion to them and things like that. For the Christie's thing? Yeah, yeah, for the crabs. And so, so then, oh, yeah. Crabs. Yeah. Yeah. and then, and then, you know, Ward and I aged that whole thing down. It's nine o'clock at night. This is contrast. This is impressionable to what happens to kids when you let them work in the movies. It's nine o'clock at night. It's perfect. The beach, the moonlight, everything. Some jerk comes from oh, yeah, from like East Chop with a four by. You could come. Uh, 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 came around. Uh, could, could be, uh, Chappaquiddick on low tide, and he could, and he did donuts right in the middle of Joe's set, and then drove away. So now we're raking some more. Very late. Throw the rakes in the truck. Harold the guard, the thermos, the dog, just like in the movies. Good night. See you tomorrow. And I'm at the bar. I'm at the boathouse, and Ward comes in, and I must look like a meerkat on meth. And Ward says, "You want to go to the company, don't you?" And I go, "Yeah. What, what's the company? What's the company?" So he says, "Get a Hudson." Put some dry color in it, throw it in the back of the truck, or go to the company. What's it? No, we knew, I knew by that time what a Hudson was. I actually knew dry color too. We threw it in the back of the truck, and we head down to the set, and there it is. We went from, in my last vision, night still, quiet, dark, day, production vans, circus, people. They had hippies that were getting, remember them? They had hippies that were getting their hair cut off in case they needed supernumeraries, which were like extra cops back then on the East Coast. <laughs> and uh, there's Roy Shuck. And, and I was walking around like a lost kid. And R Ward said, go sit in the truck. Get out of the way. Get a sandwich. I don't have any money. It's free. Go sit in the truck and watch and listen to me. And I watched him lay that track against that fence. Everything was put out there. And then all of a sudden I hear, Kevin, get the Hudson. And Okay, and I ran out there. Don't walk on the track. Oh, don't walk on the sand. Oh, and get all the way out there. And they're right there with the pile of the crabs on the arm. Roy Scheider. Steven's in a little low chair right here. Ward's behind him, the dolly grip. Joe's got that little fence. He's not happy with the way the paint is behind Roy Scheider's head. Okay, Kevin, if you put spray a little on it. Okay, that, okay, a little more. Okay, okay, that's good. Okay, thank you, Kevin. And then Steven said, thank you, Kevin. And then it got to be a joke. And everybody kept saying, thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. And, and on the, this first shot, and, and everybody knew my name. And I was like, oh my, I, I mean, I got dumped right into what the company was. So it was like, it hit me like the circus came to town at that age. And it was so indelible for everything that I got to do and got to learn, it changed my life. Jaws changed my life. I think it changed everybody's lives up here. You know? Anyway, uh, on that note, 
Let's watch Jaws. Ooh.